I invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter 35. Genesis 35. And we'll be, as is my custom, tying together the two testaments by looking at a passage in Hebrews that reminds us of Jacob and this very episode. But for now, first we read for context verses 1 through 18, though our text is 1 through 15. Genesis 35, 1 through 18. You may notice uh, in some of your Bibles there may be a heading such as Jacob's return to Bethel and the death of Rachel. We'll read about that now. And here's God's word. Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, Bethel and dwell there, and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel. And I will make an altar there to God who has answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way which I have gone. So... They gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands and the earrings which were in their ears. Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree which was by Shechem. And they journeyed and the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz or Luz in the Hebrew that is Bethel which is the land of Canaan. He and all the people who were with him And he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. Now Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried below Bethel under the terebinth tree. So the name of it was called Alon Bakuth. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Badan Aran and blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. Her name shall not be called Jacob any more, but Israel shall be your name. And so he called his name Israel. Also God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, I give to you. And to your descendants after you, I give this land. Then God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. So, God, so Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, a pillar of stone. And he poured a drink offering on it. And he poured oil on it. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him, Bethel. Then they journeyed from Bethel. And when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath, Rachel labored. And she had hard labor. Now verse 19. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Now, if you keep a marker there in Genesis 35, we'll come back to it momentarily. But we are going to look now at a parallel passage in the book of Hebrews. That hall of fame in Hebrews 11 of the, the saints of God that, uh, whose names... Uh, are recorded there for us to remind us that these Old Testament saints like Jacob fought the good fight of faith and they lived by faith in the coming Messiah. So we'll begin reading at Hebrews 11, verse 13. Hebrews 11, beginning at 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. And were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. To return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. And therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Now, verse 20, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come, 
And by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. That's God's word for God's people. And now we'll turn back to Genesis 35. And before we bring to you God's word, let's ask God to bless that effort. Thank you, Father, for your word which we have heard now and we believe by your grace. We now ask that you would cause us to take hold of what we have here in this passage and to act upon it in a way that pleases you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's an old saying that you've heard, I'm sure, over the years. The times, they are a-changing. And those of you who have a little gray hair or no hair, as the case may be, in my case, uh, have been around long enough to see, we were talking about it this morning, around the lunch table, a, this afternoon I guess it was, that what a radical shift has taken place in our country, not just recently, but since the 60s. The country is not what it used to be. Some things certainly from that time are better than they are today, such as uh, treatment of minorities and those kinds of things. There has been progress, but on the other hand, there has been great regress as well. Even as we face a new year in the United States of America, there are unsettling changes afoot. The winds of change, it seems, have become a tornado for evangelical, conservative, Protestant Christians. The future seems to be, from our perspective, uncertain. In fact, it's not too long from now in November when elections will be held and the choices between the candidates could not be sharper in terms of their world and life views. But in all of that, that old song comes to mind, Be still my soul, the Lord is on thy side. In every change, he faithful will remain. That's really what we have Here, an example of that here in the story of this part of Jacob's life. In terms of the timeline for you history buffs and you students of the Bible, this is about 1732 more or less B.C. And when we stop to think about that without rushing over that number too quickly, it's really fascinating, isn't it? We're reading a story of something that really happened to one of the children of God 3,000 600 years ago. As as the story unfolds here in Genesis, you see we see the Abrahamic covenant in full force. God had made a covenant with his uh, child Abraham and then with his son Isaac and now Jacob is Isaac is a very old man and Jacob is uh, moving into the forefront and his 12 sons. We are moving slowly in the book toward the reign of Joseph, one of the sons of Jacob. The treasury of scripture knowledge says, quote, having left Esau affectionately, Jacob returns to Canaan, end quote. But in chapter 34, if you know your Bible history, there's a, a transient, it seems, making his way in and out of the building. Uh, In chapter 34, uh, we, uh, you may have, may or may not know, you may have looked back and something very tragic happened in chapter 34, just before we read 35.1, where God says, go to Bethel. And one of the reasons God says, go to Bethel is because Dinah, one of the sisters of the 12, had been raped and she, uh, the, uh, The two of the sons of Jacob took it upon themselves to execute justice upon those, the whole community, even men, even women and children, and had done, acted in a way that caused Jacob great shame. And so in one sense, he was ready to run for his life before they come back after him. Then, besides that tragic episode, a few years after this, three years after we read this, Uh, his dearly beloved wife, Rachel, dies. So that's the stage. That's the setting of the the stage here. 
the stage is set for the next act in the history of redemption. The genesis of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now all 12 are on the scene. Or we'll read about, we'll read about, if you read the passage, you'll see how Rachel delivered Benjamin just before she died. It's the end of an era in the history of redemption. Isaac dies about 13 years after Rachel dies, and that closes out the era of Isaac. In chapter 37, just a couple chapters away, we move into the story of Joseph and the dreams of his future exaltation. That's the setting we have here. The focus here that we want to look at today, and I hope you have an outline with you, is on Jacob's son, not one of the twelve, but Jacob's son, the faithful Messiah, who, as you know, came from the tribe of Judah, one of his sons. Jacob's son, the faithful Messiah. We'll see that four things about that. One, that he faithfully reassures us in new circumstances. Two, that he faithfully protects and atones for us. And three, uh, that he faithfully keeps his promises. Let's look at these one at a time. Jacob's son, the faithful Messiah. The son of Jacob, that is to say our Lord Jesus Christ, faithfully reassures us in our new, uh, new circumstances as well. Here, as we just said, Elohim, that is the name that is given here, God, sets a new stage and he calls his people to worship. God says to Jacob, We'll just pause there as we reflect on those words because that's not something that happens all the time. We may think so as we have a cursory reading of the Bible, but it's really the times are few and far between that God comes down in and speaks to someone either in an audible voice or in a dream. It doesn't happen a lot. Here it does happen, and whenever it does happen, we should kind of sit up and take notice. God's dealings with Jacob up to this point show that how he continues to deal with his covenant people down to this very day. God does not change. His program from the Old Testament, the Old Covenant to the New Covenant certainly involved changes, but he himself is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And in many ways, he deals with his covenant people the same way as he dealt with Jacob and his family. Even as Jacob himself suffered a great deal, as we just outlined, so his church today sometimes suffers greatly before he delivers us. But this is the primary means of grace, the word of God. God said to Jacob, God gave Jacob a word, gave him direction about what he wanted his covenant child to do, what he wanted this patriarch to do. To do, He didn't transport Jacob to Bethel. God has done that before. Remember Stephen and others who were, they were there and suddenly they're over here. Or in the case of Enoch, he's walking around to, like any other day and next thing you know, he's with the Lord in heaven. God didn't transport Jacob to Bethel. He could have done that. He could have caused, saved him a lot of grief, we might say. He didn't wipe out the Canaanites and just leave vacant land for Jacob to walk in and take ownership. Instead, he spoke to Jacob, and that's God's way. God speaks to us this very day from his word. The word of God preached, the reformers taught us. The refer word of God taught, the revert re word of God read, is our primary source of comfort as disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ, the son of Jacob. What is that word of instruction here? Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, verse 1. Now, you remember the story. He had been delivered from the abuse of, his, of Laban, his relative. He had been able to get away from Esau, even though he thought for sure he was a goner, as we might say. He re and so he relied now on Yahweh, on the triune God, to the God who appeared to him when he fled from the face of Esau, his brother, the text tells us. The command comes, go. I want you to go back to Bethel, where you met me before. 
But a promise comes with that command, and always promises come with commands. Namely, I protected you in the past, Jacob. I will continue to do so, my son. And in that way, many things that we read here are the same for us today as the people of God. We're under the new covenant, it's true. But God deals with us under that covenant of grace in similar ways. He still says to us, I will be your God and you shall be my people. That's the essence of the covenant. And God says the same thing to us today in those words that he said to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is to say, I am your God and you shall be my people because I have purchased you and I have redeemed you body and soul by blood atonement of my son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, since that is true, since he is our God and since we are his people, every bit as much as Jacob and his 12 sons, therefore, he will bring you, beloved, on your entire journey through life safely each decade, no matter what. That doesn't mean to say there won't be any hardships, there won't be any what we call accidents, but he will bring you from here to Canaan, the land of promise, in one piece. That is to say, uh, watching over you the whole way so that you will move from point A to point B without anyone stopping you reaching your destination. There's another command here already in verse 1, and that is, I want you to go, when you get there, I want you to make an altar. Already under the Abrahamic covenant, we had seen other patriarchs make altars, hadn't we? An altar of sacrifice. This was the means that God had appointed for worship in those days. God chose Bethel as the next stop. Bethel means, as you may well know, the house of God. Twenty years earlier, in in chapter 28, Jacob had dreamed. You remember that famous dream? Even the children remember. The ladder that was set up on earth, the text tells us, and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending upon it. Who could forget such a place? God says, I want you to go back there. I'm sure just those words were exciting to Jacob. I know I would have been excited to say, go back. Of all the places God could have shown, Uh, chosen to send Jacob to. He chose that place. And there, Jacob's fears would be alleviated. He had been living in fear, hadn't he? He was afraid of what Laban was doing to him. He was afraid of what Esau might do to him. He was afraid of what the Canaanites might do to him in reprisal for what his sons had done to them. But now, his fears are going to be alleviated at Bethel. There's something else here that God calls, tells Jacob more, uh, more instructions here in verse 2. He calls Jacob and he commands Jacob to put away the gods of his neighbors. And so to this very day, in the covenant community, in the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, when God, Elohim, the triune God, sets a new stage for us in life, whether it's a new year like 2020 or some radical change in our life situation. When he sets a new stage for us, he calls us to put away the gods of our neighbors. Jacob said to his household, verse 2, and to all who were with him, put away the foreign gods that are among you, purify yourselves, and change your garments. In the, as the story unfolds, we find out that Rachel, who had been an idolater, uh, who had not been of the, among the covenant people, hid her, you may remember the story where she once hid her father's household idols under her saddle. Now it's 20 years later, and he still, the whole household has been affected by that idolatry. And Jacob has to stop and say, now we're going to the land of prom- the promised land. It's time to put away these foreign gods once these false idols and gods once and for all. You may have heard it said that John Calvin called the human heart a factory of idols. And by that he meant we can just mass produce them. Uh, you know, we, we, we perhaps struggle with one form of idolatry. Maybe it's greed for uh, love of money. 
and then we, the Lord gives us maybe grace to kind of get beyond that, and then there's some other pi- idol pops up that we, we, this one or this thing or that thing or the other thing takes center stage in our heart and mind and life, whether it's career, whatever it might be. Even a house can become an, anything can be an idol, is what he meant. Anything can become an idol. But by grace, that's true, but by grace, the, the grace of God in Christ, by the power, the power of regeneration, the new birth, by the work of the Son and the application of that work to our hearts by the Holy Spirit, one effect of that, of grace, is God himself putting in us a desire to remove anything in our heart or our mind or our life that comes between us and him. Christ says, it is as if Christ himself says here, put away, we could say it even more forcefully, Christ still says today, my child, put away your idols and purify yourselves. That's what God said to Jacob here. When Elohim, God, sets a new stage, he calls us to remind each other also of his past actions. We see that in verse, verses 3 and 4. Something new is happening. And not only geographically moving from somewhere around Iran or Iraq westward into the promised land that we call Palestine, but this is a new era, a new chapter in the history of redemption in the life of Jacob and his sons, especially Joseph. Eventually, we know they're going to actually end up not a, for a short time there in Canaan and then in Egypt for a long time. So when God sets a new stage as he was for Jacob here, he calls us, like he called Jacob, to remind each other of his past actions and also the fact that he is present with us. We see that in 3 and 4. Verse 3, then let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar to God, who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands and the earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree, which was by Shechem. It just sounds like a little footnote in the story and maybe not worthy of much comment, but we'll just say two quick things about that. Today, the Lord calls us in the same way. In, in his relationship with us up to this day, the Lord in this particular story is reminding us to remember when Christ answered us in the day of our distress. I think that's especially helpful as we enter a new year and a year full of uncertainty, to be sure. I suppose in some form or fashion, every year, is full of uncertainty, but this one seems to make the record books, 2020. And so the Lord calls us, that, like Jacob, remember the days gone by when you were in distress and Christ answered you in the day of your distress. Jacob is, calls to mind that God has kept him on his way, and what a strange journey it has been for him. First, with his mother and father, then because of his own shenanigans, having to run for his life with Esau hot on his trail, then all those 14 years with Laban, who, like himself, what comes around goes around, and he, the trickster, is tricked by by Laban and ends up with two wives. And finally, he is working his way back toward the promised land. And on his way, he hears Esau is coming with this massive army and fears for his life. And then this episode with Dinah where he is shamed and where his sons take the law into their own hands. But in all of that, he confesses here, God has been with me all the way. And as we are creatures of time and we move from one year to another, it's good to, for us to come back to a passage like this, something that happened 3,600 something years ago, and see how the more things change, the more they stay the same as far as God is concerned. He never changes the way he deals with his covenant people. He has been with us till this point, and he will be with us in the years to come. That's the first thing that Jacob's son, the faithful Messiah, 
is faithfully reassuring us in new circumstances. Now the second thing. In verses 5 through 8, we see how Jacob's son, the faithful Messiah, is faithfully protecting and atoning for us. We already got a little glimpse of that in, in the previous verses, but now it's fleshed out a little more. In verse 5, we read how God protects his covenant people. We spoke about that this morning as well. Look at verse 5. And they journeyed, and what? The terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. This is exactly what we would have expected. That the Canaanites, now that Jacob has gone in, his, not Jacob himself, but two of his sons have gone and wiped out a whole community in vengeance for an act of defilement of their sister. They would, Jacob is sure that they're going to be chased and, and torn to pieces. But God intervenes and God causes terror to come. We don't know what terror, but somehow he causes them to be terrified everywhere as they move. Now, the long journey from Padan Aram all the way to Israel, to the land of promise. Every, every city they went through, they get, went through with safe passage. De Graaf, in his Promise and Deliverance, writes, the security of the covenant of grace is rooted exclusively in Yahweh's faithfulness. Our future is bright, despite, and that, that's, excuse me, in, exclusively in Yahweh's faithfulness, end of quote. The graph is reminding us that God is, the fact that we can be, have a sense of security about the future is not, anchored in our political leaders it's not anchored in our position in the world as perhaps the most powerful nation on earth or any such thing or the fact that we're perhaps the wealthiest nation of the world none none of that our security comes because Yahweh or Jacob's son in this case the, is the faithful Messiah so our future is bright beloved despite all the dangers that face our children and grandchildren, then that's not to dismiss them and talk of them lightly. There are dangers, and we should be aware and protective of our children and grandchildren. But nonetheless, we have God's word on it that the, he, just as he took care of Jacob, he watches over us, whatever the circumstance and whatever the circumstance, he also calls us, we see in verses 6 through 8, to worship him through the blood of the atonement. In verse 6 we read, So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him, and he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel. That means God, house of God. Because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. We shouldn't pass over this too quickly or too lightly. This is, this is significant. There, if you count it up, I had in my notes in my study, which I decided not to bring into the pulpit, a record of all the altars that had been built. Might be a fascinating study for you sometime to look back and see. Not so many from the time of Adam to this time. This was a, this was a, a very un, unusual and, and infrequent activity. Here he builds an altar. And the altar is always made for a bloody sacrifice as a means of atonement before the covenant God. And it, of course, an altar and a bloody sacrifice always in the Old Testament points us to the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and his blood atonement on the cross of Calvary for the forgiveness of our sins through the shed blood of the spotless Lamb of God. Now, if you would... Keep your finger here and turn with me back to Hebrews. We're not going to go to 11 now. We're going to go to Hebrews 13 for a moment and then come back. Our seminary, my seminary professor told me this is always dangerous because you turn people's attention away from the text and then they find something in the passage you're turning to and you'll lose them. But we hope that won't happen. We're going to briefly look at Hebrews 13. I wanted you to see it with your own eyes to see the connection between what we're reading in Genesis and, and the significance of it as spelled out in Hebrews. In Hebrews 
uh, we, uh, 10, we read this, 13.10. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. And therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go out to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. And verse 14, therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Now back to Genesis. The altar then was the place of atonement, the sacrifice, that which typified the coming Messiah and what he would do to satisfy God's justice and wrath against sin. Now we had came to the table of the Lord this morning and we saw the sacraments displaying the same truths that a body must be broken. The spotless Lamb of God, His body must be broken. His blood, His atoning blood must be shed in order for us to be cleansed and have God's wrath appeased in our place as our substitute. The place that God appeared to Jacob was called Bethel, the house of God. And so we come to the house of God each Lord's Day. Some things change from the Old Testament. Some things remain the same. Once, once a week, the people of God continue to come to the house of the Lord. And God descends in all of our changing circumstances. He descends to meet with us week after week as the body of Christ. Worshiping in the house of God with his people as an evidence of our true faith in Christ. De Graaf again. For Christ's sake, the Father keeps giving himself to us in spite of our sins. Christ overcomes our sins day after day and year after year, end quote. That is to say, Jacob, though the scoundrel he was, God kept exercising his grace and overcoming the sinful nature of Jacob again and again and again. And the testimony of his faith is him building that altar in honor as he worshiped God and obeyed his voice. Just a little footnote in the story in verse 8, but a tragic footnote, and that is a devastating change for Jacob. Now Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried below Bethel under the terebinth tree, and so the name of it was called Alon Bakuth. And so that's the second thing. As we think about Jacob's son, the faithful Messiah, we see how he, to this day, faithfully protects and atones for us, just as he did for Jacob and his family. That's the second thing. Then the third, verses 9 through 15. I think I misspoke earlier and said four. The third thing, he is, he is faithful in keeping his promises to us. First of all, <coughs> excuse me. First of all, he remains faithful to his promise to renew his covenant in, in every generation. Verse 9. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padanaram and blessed him. So now we see this covenant renewal. This is something that comes, strikes us on the pages of Scripture from time to time. We come to a passage in Scripture where there is this covenant renewal. There's nothing new said necessarily. It's simply that what God had promised before, the, the crux of which is, I will be your God and you shall be my people. We see it again and often with another generation, the next generation. So here we see this renewal of the Abrahamic covenant. God blessed him. God blesses Jacob again, and he repeats the promises of the covenant. And that's what God does through all 66 books of the Bible, doesn't he? Over and over and over again, he repeats to us not only his laws, but also his promises. In Christ, the Lord shows himself to be the only provider of true blessedness and happiness. These are the same promises that Jacob heard since he was a little kid, but they're new circumstances. And so God, knowing our weakness, takes Jacob aside once more and repeats his promise. You've had to do that in your homes, haven't you? 
Don't you, when your children are young, have to repeat yourself over and over? But, Daddy, you promised. Yes, and I'm, I'm going to promise you again. I know Christmas is 320 days away, but I promise you <laughs> I'll do such and such. For um, this coming Christmas, I plan on getting this or that, whatever it might be. We, when our children are little, our memory, we suffer from short-term memory, don't we? And we forget the promises. And so it is as God deals with us as his children. New circumstances, the promises come again. That's one reason why we meet every Lord's Day, to hear those promises over and over again, year after year, now as we enter a new year. The promises in Christ spur us on when we become weary, when we face an uncertain future like we do now. But God remains faithful. The Messiah, the son of Jacob, remains faithful to his promises. One of those promises we see in verse 10. And that is that we, have a new, we are promised a new identity in Christ Jesus, the son of Jacob, the son of Judah, the son of David. Verse 10, God said to him, that is Jacob, your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. Now, you know this play on words that here, those of you who know your Bible well, Jacob, the old King James said his name meant supplanter. He was a trickster. He was a deceiver. But God changes his name from trickster to prince with God. What a radical new name. Imagine if you had the nickname trickster or deceiver, and then suddenly people began calling you Prince with God. What a radical, what a radical change is here. He had wrestled with God and prevailed, the scriptures tell us, by the strength that was given to him. He had a new name. He had a more noble name. And so it is with us in Christ. We have a new name. Revelation 14.1 says, I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000, here it is, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And or Revelation 22, 3. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the lamb shall be in it and his servants shall, be, shall serve him. They shall see his face and his name shall be on their foreheads. Owned by God. That's what's stamped by the triune God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's what's figuratively stamped on our foreheads. We're given a new name in Christ, just like Jacob. He remains too faithful to his promise to add to his covenant community. Besides the new name, another promise is God will add to his covenant community generation after generation after generation. Remember how many generations have passed since these things were written. 3,600 years. And God is still adding to his church daily, such as should be saved. He says in verse 11, God said to him, I am God Almighty, that's El Shaddai. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. I am El Shaddai. God says, the mighty God. And so as he renews this Abrahamic covenant, as he ratifies this Abrahamic covenant, now with the next generation, not only Jacob, but Jacob's 12 sons, he reminds us and we, he, he anticipates the coming of his son into the world in, so that in Christ we are part of a new nation, that by his might we can be sh sure that El Shaddai will continue to add a multitude of nations to Christ's kingdom. We live in an amazing time, brothers and sisters, and a time that others could only dream about in the 21st century, that in every single nation around the globe, there are people who worship the one true God and the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son. That couldn't be said that long ago. There were still enclaves and nations, backward nations that we might say, that had not yet had any influence of the gospel. 
Think about just even the last 60 years or so since 1959. How many Christians have come into the kingdom of God from all six continents? I say six because not so many in Antarctica probably. But think of how many people have come into the kingdom of God. Millions, no doubt, in the last, perhaps a billion in the last 60 years. Only God's know, God knows. But this is already anticipated 3,600 years ago when the Lord makes this promise to Jacob that many nations are made one in Christ. And sometimes we will see that with our own eyes. People gathered from every kindred, every tribe, every tongue, any nation, every nation gathered around the throne of the Lamb to worship as one. A holy nation, writes Peter. All Christians worldwide are spiritual children of Jacob. Jacob is our great, great, great grandfather in the faith. At this point in time, this once trickster, now prince with God, is promised that he will be the king of the promised land. And he will go there not as somebody running away, but as somebody who is going to be established with and become a great people there. And following the, the death of Jacob, then will come his son Judah, and then David, and then the line of kings, and then finally David's greatest son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that in Christ we have not only a new name, and not only are we made part of a new nation, but we are have a new king. Once our king was the world, our kings were the world and the flesh and the devil, but now in Christ we have a new king. In Christ we not only have a new king, but we are promised that we are co-regents. Revelation 22, there shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. You see the connection between what was promised to Jacob that kings would come from his body and what's promised to you as a child of God that you will reign with Christ forever and ever. But there's more, a little bit more. Verse 12 now, not only all that is promised to the people of God, but more in 12, the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac I give to you and to your descendants after you I give this land. Hebrews 11 helps us understand that that promise was fulfilled in terms of Solomon's great expanse of his kingdom, covering a great deal of territory and rich beyond belief. But that was only a type of what was coming. Hebrews 11, we read, fleshes out what the ultimate homeland is. Not the land, that little piece of real estate called Palestine, but the new heavens and the new earth. Hebrews eleven fourteen. they who say such things declare plainly. They seek a homeland. Truly, if they'd called to mind that country from which they'd come out, they would have desired, had opportunity to return. But now, they desire a better, a heavenly country. And therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. A new land, the promised land, awaits us too in Christ. Because Jacob's son remains faithful to his promise to meet with us, to communicate with us, as he did with Jacob. Verse 13, God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. And that was an amazing thing. That must have been an amazing thing for Jacob to see God face to face once again and commune with him and talk with him that way. But really it pales in comparison to what came later. What we read about in the, on, the store, on the pages of the Gospels, where Christ descended, the God-man descended to us in his incarnation, and that he then us rose from the dead, and that he ascended back in the clouds, back to where he once was in all his glory, that now he, seats, he is seated there at the right hand of God the Father, so that according to his Godhead, and majesty, and grace, and spirit, even though he's there in heaven, he's at no time absent from us. He meets with us, and he speaks to us every day to his bride and his body. 
And finally, in verses 14 and 15, this was a new day for the 12 tribes of Israel. Verse 14, so Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it. In other words, all that to say, the gist of the verse 14 is that this was just a pit stop. This was just a temporary spiritual oasis for Jacob's family. They weren't going to linger there. It was an important stop. It was a place for covenant renewal and confirmation of the Lord's promises. It was a special time for Jacob to pause and give thanks to the triune God for bringing him back to Bethel safely. And in a similar way, this one day in seven is a special time for us to remember what God has done for us in Christ, to give thanks for what God has done for us in Christ, to think about the Father and the Son of Jacob and the Holy Spirit and how they have been faithful to their promises to us, even as God was faithful in his promises to Jacob. And so in 15, Jacob calls the name of the place where God spoke with him, Bethel. This quote, as we come near the end, from Robert Candlish. I think you have it on your bulletin. Thus then, in the circumstances which are here brought together in this chapter, experiencing a gracious revival, chastened and afflicted in his dearest affections, honored with the last visit to, of God to renew and ratify his covenant, with his family of 12 sons now complete, but, alas, completed at the cost. Of Rachel's life. All these wonderful things coming to fruition in the life of Jacob, but all pointing forward to the coming of his great, great, great grandson, Jesus of Nazareth, Jacob's son, the faithful Messiah, who is always faithfully reassuring us in our changing circumstances, who is always faithfully protecting us, and whose atonement cannot be altered and stands fast and sure forever, who always faithfully keeps all of his promises to us in him. All God's promises are yes and amen. And so we'll sing in a moment, Great is thy faithfulness, O God, our Father. Let's pray.